The old hotel stood tall, its Victorian architecture looming over the quiet street like a dark sentinel. As the night fell, the usual hustle and bustle of the city dissipated into an eerie silence, leaving only the occasional echo of footsteps and distant traffic. Inside the hotel, the dim lights flickered, casting long shadows down the empty corridors. I was accustomed to the solitude of the night shift, finding solace in the quiet hours when the world seemed to slow down. But on this particular night, an ominous feeling lingered in the air, a sense of foreboding that prickled at the back of my neck. As the clock struck midnight, I began my rounds, checking the locks on each door and ensuring that everything was in order. The corridors seemed to stretch endlessly, the darkness pressing in on me from all sides. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that unseen eyes followed my every move. As I made my way to the top floor, a sudden chill swept through the air, causing me to shiver involuntarily. I quickened my pace, eager to finish my rounds and retreat to the safety of the front desk. But as I turned the corner, I froze in horror. Standing at the end of the hallway was a figure cloaked in darkness, its form barely discernible in the dim light. My heart pounded in my chest as I struggled to make sense of what I was seeing. It seemed to sway gently, as if floating on an unseen breeze. Summoning all the courage I could muster, I called out, my voice trembling with fear. Uh, who's there? There was no response, only the sound of my own ragged breathing echoing off the walls. I took a tentative step forward, my hand reaching out to grasp the nearest wall for support. But as I moved closer, the figure seemed to vanish into thin air, leaving me alone in the empty corridor. I stood there for what felt like an eternity, my mind racing with fear and uncertainty. Had I imagined the whole thing? Or was there something truly sinister lurking in the shadows of the hotel? With trembling hands, I continued my rounds, my senses on high alert for any sign of danger. But as the night wore on, the feeling of unease only grew stronger, a gnawing sensation that refused to be ignored. As I reached the end of the corridor, I heard a faint sound coming from one of the rooms. It was a soft, plaintive moan, barely audible above the steady hum of the air conditioning. My heart skipped a beat as I hesitated, unsure of what to do next. Against my better judgment, I approached the door, my hand hovering over the handle. With a deep breath, I pushed it open, the hinges creaking in protest. What I saw on the other side would haunt me for the rest of my days. Lying on the bed was a woman, her pale skin illuminated by the dim light filtering in through the curtains. She was writhing in pain, her eyes wide with terror as she gasped for breath. But it wasn't her appearance that filled me with dread, it was the gaping wound that marred her throat, the blood staining the sheets around her. I staggered back, my mind reeling with shock and horror. How had she ended up like this? And where was the perpetrator? My thoughts raced as I frantically searched the room for any clue that might explain what had happened. But before I could find anything, a sound echoed from the hallway outside, a low, guttural growl that sent chills down my spine. I knew in that moment that I was not alone, that something sinister lurked in the darkness, waiting to strike. With a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, I realized that I had stumbled upon something far more sinister than I could have ever imagined. And as the night wore on, I could only pray that I would survive until morning. The hours passed in a blur of fear and adrenaline, each moment dragging on like an eternity. Every creak of the floorboards, every whisper of the wind outside, sent me spiraling deeper into despair. I was trapped in a nightmare from which there seemed to be no escape. But just when I thought I couldn't bear it any longer, a faint light appeared on the horizon, signaling the arrival of dawn. With a surge of hope, I gathered my courage and made my way to the front desk, desperate to put an end to the horror that had consumed me. As the first rays of sunlight flooded the hotel lobby, I breathed a sigh of relief, grateful to have survived the night. But as I glanced back at the empty corridors and silent rooms, I couldn't shake the feeling that the darkness still lingered, waiting to claim its next victim. And so, as the sun rose on a new day, I vowed to never forget the terror that had haunted me in the dead of night, to always remember that evil can lurk in the most unexpected of places. For in the shadows of the old hotel, something sinister waits, biding its time until the next unsuspecting soul wanders into its grasp. As so this happened a little over two years ago now, and I wanted to share it somewhere just to look back on it one day and never forget the lesson I learned. It was 2016, and I had just started a new job at a motel. It was low pay, but I needed an office job. One of my friends, Michael, got me this job. For a few days, I did training with the owner in the mornings. For two nights, Michael trained me. Our job was the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift, nothing exciting, checking guests in and doing paperwork. My boss, or the owner, went away with his wife on vacation for a week, which is attributed to the swift training I had to endure. So it was my first night alone on the night shift. There was a monitor with security cameras around the motel's property and large glass windows all around the office building with a glass door. 
There was no night window like most motels have. It was fairly early in the night at about 1 a.m. I was just doing my normal check-in paperwork. That's when a man walks in and asks if we have any rooms available. Usually, if someone's sketchy, my boss has me lie and say no, but he seemed normal at the moment. Without hesitation, I said yes, of course, just for one. And he replies yes. So I begin creating the reservation on the computer when I notice he starts swatting the air and making spitting noises as if he's being surrounded by flies. I try to ignore it. As far as I'm concerned, it wasn't my business. So I try to check him into the room as quickly as possible. I give him his key and he's on his way. At this point in time, I could be described as very timid. I had a lot going on in my personal life, so I hope you can all understand my reaction to what happens next. The man comes back from his room and slams his hand on the glass door, causing me to jump absolutely frightened. I look up to see him just staring at me. He cracks the door and puts his head through and says, I can't get into my room. Why won't you let me into my room? And my only defense is trying to be helpful, so I replied, maybe there's something wrong with your key. Let me give you another one. The look he had in his eyes was inexplainable. I felt like I was in absolute danger. I handed him his new key and he went back to his room. I tried texting Michael because he's the one who trained me, though it was in the middle of the night and he was asleep. I needed some guidance. With no reply from Michael, I noticed the man trudging down the stairs to come back. I go into absolute panic mode. I run into the back office and lock the door and I pull out my pocket knife. It's important to keep protection when working at night. I hear the man in the office yelling, hello, hello. Why won't you let me into my room? Do you not like me? Me being an absolute idiot and not standing my ground and just calling the police when I'm feeling scared, I decided to take the situation on alone. I reply, I'm just on the phone. I'll be right out. I then start calling Michael over and over for help. No answer. I decided to take a few breaths and then step out of the office. The man was not there, he was in the bathroom. I start hearing him talking to himself angrily, saying, kill her, kill her. My heart sank. Still being an idiot and not calling the police, he comes out and I say, your key was broken. I am sorry. Let me escort you to your room. He agrees. Thankfully, I was wearing a long-sleeved sweater, so with my arms down, I was able to hide my knife in my hand while holding it. I began to walk outside, and he seemed insistent to walk behind me. We begin making our way to the staircase and up towards his room. I was sweating from how nervous I was, continuously looking behind me to make sure he wasn't going to make a move. He stops at a room, and I stop at his room a few doors down. I smile and say, oh, that's the wrong room. This is your room, as it clearly said on the door. This whole time, he was going to someone else's room and trying to open the door. After letting him into his room, I quickly ran back to the office and locked the door. And I found out there was a lone woman staying in the other room he was trying to get into. The next guest I checked in was a police officer from a few towns over. I felt bad for confiding in him about the guy, but he seemed willing to keep an eye and ear out. The next night, the man came back, but I had the doors locked and told him we're all booked up. I explained to my boss what happened when he got back from vacation. However, he didn't take it very seriously. I continue to work there on the night shift for the next year, where many other strange encounters have happened, but this was one of the worst. I work in the pro department of a home improvement company. I worked the closing shift with another cashier who I'll call Nicole. Nicole's a really kind but quite timid cashier. She's also very pretty, so she has a lot of contractors hit on her. It's usually not that worrisome though, a few compliments, maybe a dinner invite which she'd politely decline. I would probably ask her out as well if it wasn't for one detail. Nicole does have a girlfriend, so being hit on by guys on a daily basis makes her rather uncomfortable. When we first met, I told her she ought to tell those guys about being gay, but she kept saying it wasn't any of their business, so she kept that part to herself. Nicole has become my best friend, and having another cashier there with you keeps things from getting lonely. We even cover for each other's lunch breaks. One day when I came back from lunch, Nicole started telling me about this rather creepy guy who was flirting with her. She said she politely turned him down, saying she was with someone already, and while he didn't seem happy, he did leave. I shrugged it off as nothing more than the usual horny guy and laughed it off. But later that day the man came back. 
Nicole wasn't there as she had left to help a customer find some lumber, so it was just me. He looked rather normal, probably handsome to most women, but he acted off. After looking around the area, I asked him if I could help him with anything. I'm here to see Nicole, he told me. I asked him how he knew her, and he said he had come in earlier and asked her out, to which she said yes, so he had come back in to pick her up. I told him she had left for the day, a usual lie everyone tells to cover for their friends. His smile went away as he started looking annoyed. He said he wanted to speak to Nicole and ask her out again, which contradicted what he had just told me about accepting his previous invite. I told him he could not do that, which caused him to cross his arms and ask me why not. I'm not the best liar when it comes to making up excuses on the spot. However, I didn't want to tell him Nicole was gay if she didn't want him to know it, so I just blurted out that Nicole was my fiancé. His annoyed look went to confusion as he asked me how someone as pretty as she is could go out with someone like me. I told him it didn't matter and that her and I were getting married in a couple of months, so he needed to back off. He gave me a death look but didn't say anything. After an awkward silence he left. After Nicole had gotten back, I told her what went down. She asked me to describe him and after I told her what he looked like, she said that was the same guy who came in before. She was a bit creeped out by what went down, but she found the fiancé excuse rather funny. She even stated she'd rather be engaged to me than go out with him, which I'm guessing was a compliment. A couple of weeks went by, and we had all but forgotten about the man at this point. But one night, after it had gotten dark, Nicole and I were getting the trash together so we could close down the registers and go home. Just then, we hear a bang at the door, causing both of us to nearly jump out of our skins. It was the guy again. He had a wild look in his eyes as he kept his face pressed against the glass. Ah, we're closed, I tell him, but he insists he needs to come in. Nicole yells again to tell him she's not interested and for him to go away and leave her alone. But he yells that he's not here for her, he's here for me. He then says that if he can take out her husband, then she'd be all his, based on that he wanted to kill me. I tell Nicole to run to the manager's office and call the police, and I'll stay here and watch him. I won't lie though, I was pretty afraid to be in that tiny little area. If the guy is able to get in, he wasn't the biggest guy, but he could have had a weapon on him. Plus, the store doesn't allow us to have self-defense items on us, so I was on my own here. The guy then started ramming the sliding doors like he was crazy. The doors were rattling. I could have sworn they were going to come off their base. Just then, Nicole comes running back around the corner with a 2x4 in her hand, yelling that the cops are on their way. Finally, the man decided to leave. The closing manager met the officers when they came, and he took them to review the cameras. Thankfully, the man was caught and arrested. But Nicole nor I felt safe working there any longer. We're still friends and even attend the same college together, but we do have separate jobs now while we pay our way through classes. I'm glad she was there to help me with the rogue man, as I hate to imagine what he might have done to me, or worse, what he might have done to her. She says she's glad I was there for her as well, as having a guy around tends to make men like him less confident in what they might try. It was a wake-up call for me as to how dangerous it can be for some girls when an interested guy just doesn't want to take no for an answer. I regrettably used to work at a hotel in our town. Our town had gotten hit by a hurricane a few months back and a lot of houses were badly damaged, so a lot of people vacated the place. The hotel is about a 20-minute walk from my house. The town and hotel name I'll leave out of this, as I really just don't want anything traced back to me. The hotel was a very standard bed and breakfast type place, you know, where they serve wet scrambled eggs, frozen sausages, and assorted cereals. The hotel had a busy month after the hurricane as some people were out of their houses due to damages, but after a while, things quieted down, if anything, quieter than before the hurricane. I always worked nights from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m., then someone would relieve me at 2 a.m. and they'd work till 10 o'clock or 11 a.m. I could always see how many people were checked into the hotel, and at the time it was only maybe 9 rooms, which wasn't a lot at all. I could go the whole night sometimes without seeing anyone. There was a back break room for employees with a coffee machine, fridge, table, and a couple of sofa-type chairs. The employee bathroom was also back here. At night, I spent most of my time back here. There was a bell at the front desk that people would ring if they needed anything. I was in the back when I heard a deep voice from the lobby saying hello repeatedly. I got up and went through the door leading to behind the counter and saw a man on the other side of the glass. There was a glass barrier with an opening underneath, about 10 inches high. He said he needed towels. 
I grabbed him a couple of extra towels and slid them under the glass for him. He grabbed them rather aggressively, shot me this weird look, then walked to the room's hallway. I stayed in the lobby now, sitting in the rolling chair by the monitors, and I just watched that man on the camera walk down the hallway. He was looking around weirdly, then he started rubbing the towels on his face. I said out loud, what in the world? Then he got in the elevator, so I went back to the break room. It was maybe 10 minutes later when I heard a voice again from the lobby. It was the same voice. I walked back out and that man was standing on the other side again. He said very loudly, a my key card is broken. I asked what his room number was. He said it was something random like 2C, something with a letter in it. Our hotel room strictly had numbers, no letters, so I knew this man was lying. I told him, sir, our rooms don't have letters. Are you sure you're staying here? His reaction was not something I was expecting, nor was it something I wish I ever had to be victim to. He threw the towels on the floor, started smiling slightly, tilting his head as he got closer to the glass. When his face was practically pressed up against the glass, he said, I'm going to kill you, still with a smile on his face. Then he said it again, louder and again. Each time he said it, it got louder, until it was almost a scream. I screamed back at him, I'm calling the police, and I did. I picked up the phone and showed him as I dialed 911. He kept his disturbing smile as he now started mocking me, calling the police, as I spoke to the dispatcher on the phone, explaining very loudly what was happening in front of my face. The sick man laughed and headed for the door in a slow walk. I told the dispatcher he was leaving, and when he was gone through the doors and out of sight, I said he was gone. She asked me if I still wanted an officer to show up, and I said no, it's all right. So the next couple of hours of my shift went slow. I decided, for obvious reasons, to hang around in the lobby now instead of the break room. There was one guest who checked in during this time. At around 2 a.m., my relief came. I clocked out and was free to go home. I walked outside to the parking lot. It was cold out. I remember wishing I brought my coat. I walked with my hands in the pockets of my light jacket and my hood up. Then I heard a voice in the parking lot. I turned around. There was a line of bushes that covered the first floor windows of the hotel. It came from the bushes. I don't know what the voice said. I didn't care. I walked faster now. Once I got out of the parking lot, I was on a main road for a brief minute, but there were no cars on the road in this quiet town at this hour. After a minute, I turned left down a residential street that would eventually turn onto my block. It was dead silent out, not even the sound of any distant traffic, just the sound of my shoes hitting the pavement. And then the sound of someone else's shoes hitting the pavement behind me, only it was the sound of someone running, as if on their tiptoes, trying to be quiet. By the time I turned around they stopped. There was a car right behind me, and I almost knew that there was someone hiding behind it. I heard laughing and then a familiar voice saying quietly, I'm going to kill you. Without even seeing him, I knew it was that man. I looked around, planning out my next move. I couldn't outrun a man, let alone wearing my work shoes. I looked at the nearest house. It had an upstairs light on. Someone was awake. I would go run and ring the doorbell for help. I looked back at the car, and I saw him, that man, peeking his eyes out from behind the car as he inched around it to the front. When he got to the hood, the rest of his face and upper body were exposed, and I could see his disgusting, crazy smile again. I ran for the house, screaming, help me. I made it to the front door and rang the bell at least three times, and that's when the man grabbed me and started choking me, whispering in my ear, die. In that moment, I thought my life was flashing before my eyes, and then an angel in the form of a man opened the front door to the house and screamed, hey, at the man choking me. The man's grip was released from my neck and I fell to the floor. I never turned to watch the man run away, but the man from the house helped me up and brought me inside. He gave me water and called the police for me, and I explained the whole story to the police. They collected the CCTV footage of the man from the hotel and put feelers out to track him. I was called into the police station when they did a lineup of people who looked similar to the man on the CCTV footage and I was asked to point out which man I thought was him. I looked at all five of them for like five minutes and I ultimately said it wasn't any of them. I don't know if the pressure and nerves got to me, but in the moment, I truly didn't recognize him to be in that lineup. I hope to this day I didn't make a mistake and let that man roam.